Hello everybody, uh, my name is Owen Clayton, I teach at the University of Leeds uh, where I'm also completing my PhD. Um, over the last four years I've taught at the universities of Leeds, Lincoln and Oxford and I've also taught A-level and AS level as well so I've seen the educational system at different levels simultaneously and that has given me some insight into some of the problems that students have uh, when they're making that difficult transition between A-level and degree level and that's led me to create some of these lectures. Now the lecture today is how to write good essays at degree level um, and this is going to primarily uh, think about writing style okay it's going to address the question of how to write well in an academic context um, and for a companion piece you can look at my other podcasted lecture which is how to create effective arguments and in many ways these two things are, are two sides of the same coin really so um, that lecture is talking much more about content and this one is much more talking about form um, so with, in this lecture we're going to be thinking about not really the what of writing, not really the content, but more the how of writing. Okay, um, and the, in a half an hour lecture, I can't really cover everything in enough depth. It's just not possible. So what's going to happen is I'm going to run through various various examples, various problems that students run into, uh, quite common problems that students run into during their first year. And um, if you find that you have a gap in your knowledge at any point, or if you think, oh yes, actually I'm quite weak in that area, or if there's something I mentioned that you're not fully happy with, then it's your responsibility when you get to university to actually try to solve these problems yourself. Um, and there's various ways that you can do that. Most universities have skills service. Um, most universities have uh, tutors which have office hour, who have office hours, and that's particularly the case uh, when you get your essays back. It's particularly useful to go and see your tutor in an office hour uh, when you're getting feedback on, on an essay because you can get one-to-one -one feedback and your tutor can tell you exactly what is the, the, are the main issues with your writing in terms of areas of weakness or areas that require improvement. And that's the kind of one-to-one -one, uh, tuition that you can't even get in a seminar. Um, and it has to be said that office hours are quite often underused by students, so I very much would recommend you use those. Um, but also, if there are any things that I say today and you want to know more about, about those things, you can, of course, use Google. But uh, if you want to be slightly more academic about it, um, you can, when you get to university, go to your university library and get out one of the many, many books that exist on writing undergraduate essays. Okay, All university libraries have have lots of books on writing undergraduate essays and that is something that you could do when you first arrive at university in your first term you could get two or three books on writing undergraduate essays and that will give you a bit of a head start and hopefully would mean that you would actually avoid a lot of the problems that first-year students get into when they when they first come to university Okay, so how is this lecture going to break down um, it's going to be structured in, in three parts we're going to um, look at uh, use of language, uh, firstly, uh, and then we're going to look at writing clearly and coherently. Uh, and then the third section we're going to look at is the importance of writing in active sentences. Okay, all right, so let's first of all go to use of language. Um, and it's, uh, it's important at university, and this might be perhaps slightly contrary to people's expectations, that you try to be as straightforward in your use of language as possible. Now, sometimes first-year undergraduates uh, have a tendency to try to use overly long words in their essays uh, to try to impress the tutor. Um, and that very rarely works. And the reason that that very rarely works is that sometimes when people learn a new word, and perhaps it's quite a long, convoluted word, they will quite often throw it into the essay at all different points. And it's quite obvious when people are doing that that they don't fully understand exactly what that word means. Okay. Now, uh, you will learn complicated technical terms at university okay whatever your degree uh, is you will no doubt be learning complicated technical terms uh, but the point is that when you learn those technical terms is that you use them appropriately okay and that's the skill and so it's really important when you learn those technical terms those quite long words quite often um, that you really are a hundred percent sure that you know what they mean before you use them it also means that you shouldn't just throw them in willy-nilly and sometimes it might mean that when you're using a word like that um, you might actually there might actually be a much more simple way that you can describe what you mean you don't necessarily always have to go for the, the longer words so in using polysyllabic words, you need to ask yourself whether or not a simpler word might possibly have been better. Um, if you don't do 
this, then it's possible to come off as sounding rather pompous or pretentious or full of yourself, uh, which is something that has to be said is a charge that's often levelled at academics. Uh, I think usually unfairly, but perhaps sometimes fairly. Um, so you want to avoid using um, overly complicated words just for the sake of it, just for trying to impress, because as I say, it really won't work. Now, to give you uh, some examples, um, and these are slightly silly examples, um, so, uh, Nelson told his troops at the Battle of Trafalgar that England expects every man to do his duty. Now, um, a more modern and a more perhaps bureaucratic, pompous version of this same statement might read something like this. It is anticipated that, as regards the current emergency, personnel will face up to the issues and exercise appropriately the functions allocated to their respective contractual obligations. All right, now that is quite a wordy statement, isn't it? It's quite hard to read. Um, it's pretty horrible to listen to, and you know, you almost run out of breath when you're saying it. Um, let me give you another couple of examples. Um, we're actually going to uh, do an exercise here. So we're going to have an, have an exercise through the camera lens, um, and I want you to, uh, to shout out the answer to see if you, can, if you can get the answer. So what we've got here are a couple of long-winded translations of famous phrases. Okay, So I've taken a famous phrase, and I've turned it into a, a long-winded version of the same phrase. So what I want you to do is see if you can guess the original phrase. Okay, So just shout it out, and the, the first person to, uh, to be able to, to shout it out uh, in, in your class or wherever you're listening to this um, can lord it over all the rest of them because you're obviously very clever. Okay, uh, so here we go. Here's the first one. So this is a famous phrase. See if you can guess the original. In the absence of the feline predator, the rodent scavengers can engage in recreational activity. Anyone? Anyone know what that is? Okay, well, hopefully by this point somebody's actually shouted it out. <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. It is, of course, when the, ca the cat's away, the mice will play. Okay, um, now uh, let me give you one more example. Now this is a quotation, okay, so this is a quotation from a very famous play. So see if you can guess the original. That which we call Rosa Alba, by any alternative designation, would be just as pungent to the olfactory system. Anyone? Okay, hopefully somebody has called that out. That is, of course, uh, that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, which is from Romeo and Juliet. Now, the, the point of giving you these long-winded translations is that, as you can see, although they sound horrible, these long-winded versions of famous phrases or famous quotations actually carry the same meaning. Okay, they actually mean the same thing. They might sound different, but they mean the same thing. And what that means is that there is actually many, many ways that you can make the same point. Okay, um, and this is something that's important to realize because how you say something can be as important as what you're saying. Okay, uh, you actually have a range of choices with how you say things. It's not just that you're delivering particular information or a particular argument. It's also important the way that you do that. Okay, um, now thankfully the English language is an incredibly rich resource. Okay, the English language has developed over centuries and it's got influences from going back to the Anglo-Saxons to uh, the Latin to German and French and Spanish and, and so on. So it's got an incredibly rich vocabulary. And if you find that you've used a word and you don't entirely think it's suitable, perhaps it makes you come across as you know, a little pompous or perhaps it doesn't quite mean exactly what you wanted it to mean. Okay? Um, there are lots of synonyms in the English language, okay? so you can always substitute a word for another word. Okay, synonym, just in case anybody doesn't know, is a word that means roughly the same thing as another word. Okay, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples just in a second. So what I'm talking about here is precision of language, okay? Trying to say exactly what it is you mean and always choosing the right words for that. Now, synonyms have different connotations, okay? And some are going to be more appropriate than others. And you should always try to use the most appropriate word. So, let me give you um, an example. Um, does the story The Turn of the Screw take place in a house, a mansion, a building, a structure, a dwelling place, a home, a residence, and or a domicile. Okay, now all of those words are synonyms of each other. They mean roughly the same thing. Roughly, not exactly, but roughly. But as you can tell, no doubt, they have very, very different connotations. So home 
and residence sound very different. They have very different associations. Residence sounds quite formal. Home sounds quite the opposite. It sounds quite informal. It might make you think of your parents and chestnuts roasting on an open fire and that sort of thing. Yeah, the, 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 the dog asleep on your lap. Okay, um, so they have very different connotations. Now, the reason that this is important is in an academic essay, you're trying to be um, formal, okay? An academic essay is a formal piece of work, and you're trying to sound as objective as possible. In fact, you're trying to be as objective as possible. Um, and that, now, an academic essay is, you know, not the same as a Facebook update or a, a Twitter update, okay? And it's not the same as just chatting with your friends. So you do need to be writing in as formal way as possible and in as objective a manner as possible. And it's your word choice that can give you the appropriate academic tone or conversely can give you uh, quite the wrong kind of tone, can be much too informal and much too chatty and can make you sound like you don't care perhaps when I'm sure that that's not true. Okay, uh, related to this issue of objectivity is the use of the first person. Now, sometimes this can be a little bit of a controversial issue in the sense that tutors and teachers will tell students sometimes not to use the first person. And perhaps that's appropriate in some disciplines, uh, but in, I think in the arts, or certainly in literature, the study of literature where I come from, I think it's fine to use the first person. Um, however, it's only fine to use the first person so long as you avoid the language of subjective response. Okay. Uh, in other words, that you avoid talking about your feelings or you avoid being overly subjective. And if you're going to use the first person, if you're going to use the I, um, I would say you should use it quite sparingly and you should use it in instances where you're not being subjective and where no one can really disagree with what you're saying. So, um, I claim or I argue, that would be fine. Okay, I claim that or I argue that, okay, because by saying those things you are doing them, so no one can really dismiss it. Um, but saying things like, I feel that this is the case, that is too subjective. I think even I believe this is the case is probably too subjective as well. Um, and certainly things like, I found this book moving, or I found this book interesting, or I found this book fascinating, that's far too subjective because you're actually there talking about your personal response to the book. And that is not what uh, an, an English literature say uh, essay is actually supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about a critical analysis of the work, not really how you responded to it. Um, OK. Um, also, related to this uh, issue of kind of, I suppose, e emotional language, um, avoid saying things things like the plot is boring okay sometimes you get people saying that and well it might be boring but you know don't don't say that I think the chances are I probably would disagree with you anyway um, and certainly don't say this poem is depressing okay that, that's that's one I've, I've had on numerous occasions in in essays and I usually end up you know getting depressed myself when I read it and banging my head on the table because I think well on the one hand, I don't agree that that poem is depressing. On the other hand, it's a bit of a value judgment, that word, depressing. Um, you're sort of suggesting that poems you know, shouldn't look at the darker sides of existence, which I think is one of the purposes of art, really. Uh, I mean, life is not all kittens and puppies, is it, right? Um, so if you wanted to um, maybe perhaps make the same point, but you wanted to avoid being overly emotional or overly subjective in your language, you could use a synonym. Okay, so um, a, a synonym for depressing w w would vary depending on exactly the poem, but you might, be, uh, you might choose something like um, melancholic or critical or political or nihilistic. There's a variety of words you could choose which have a much more academic, much more rigorous tone to them. Okay, um, so we're partly talking about pruning unnecessary words here as well, and often these emotional words are often unnecessary, and if you get rid of them, your uh, sentences would work just as well. Um, it's sometimes in first year essays, people tend to gush a little bit, they get kind of, you know, over enthusiastic about a poem. Um, so you should avoid superlative words, okay. Uh, now, partly it's, it's um, adjectives such as fabulous or tremendous or perfect, um, but it's also adverbs like terribly, extremely, wholly, very, okay? Now, those latter ones might seem slightly surprising, but they, they are unnecessary, those words, because they are just really uh, enhancing the, the words that come after them, so they're not really necessary. 
Um, and it has to be said, when it comes to superlatives, um, like fabulous and tremendous and so on, uh, undergraduates do tend to throw those around like confetti at a wedding. So, and it, it does give your writing a slightly immature uh, feeling, so you should, you should watch out for that. Um, uh, I should just briefly, I suppose, add that adjectives and adverbs um, are very important and can actually be used very well, very effectively, and can actually make your writing more concise. But you just need to be careful of the kinds of adjectives and adverbs that I've just mentioned. Um, Okay, it's also important, uh, in my view, to avoid vague modifying terms. Um, now, the, the, the two that I particularly have in mind are almost and seems to. Okay, and this might seem slightly prescriptive on my part, uh, but I tend to find that undergraduates use almost and seems to um, far too much in their work, and it makes uh, a person's work seem um, much, too, much too vague. Let me give you an example. Um, a fairly typical, typical example might be, um, the turn of the screw almost seems to be an uncanny text. Okay, the turn of the screw almost seems to be an uncanny text. I read that and I'm not 100% sure whether the person who wrote it thinks that the turn of the screw is or isn't an uncanny text. Um, now, one way to, to rewrite that so that it would be more concise and more powerful, the turn of the screw is an uncanny text. It's pretty simple that, but undergraduates often seem to be uh, slightly scared of using words like is or is not because it's too definite almost. And I think it shows a kind of lack of confidence when people are, are using the, the terms almost and seems to. And whenever I talk to undergraduates about why they use those, those vague terms, um, they often do say it's because they were slightly scared that what they were saying might be wrong. And so if they put almost or seems to in, then they're kind of covering their backs in a sort of linguistic fashion. And, and I would say that that's not a very good idea because it does just sound like you're not very confident in the assertions that you're making. Okay. So a few other quick tips before we move on to the next section. Um, it's important to avoid contractions, uh, and that's because they aren't formal enough, okay? So um, aren't should become are not, shouldn't, should not, haven't, have not, and so on. Um, be careful of cliché, indeed, avoid it like the plague. Um, now, the problem with cliché is that, well, not only is it slightly boring to read, uh, but also it sort of suggests that your brain fell asleep for a little while while you were writing it, and you just sort of reached for a phrase, a well-worn phrase off the shelf and used it. Okay. Um, and I would, uh, I would also give a little, little tip here and say, uh, keep your sentences fairly short. Um, now, th there's no absolute rules about this, and I'm certainly gonna, not going to give a number of words that you should use. I think your, your sentences, however, should be fairly short because when students get into problems with their writing, uh, they, they can often be solved by having shorter sentences. I think the longer your sentences are, the more problems they can accrue as they, uh, as they expand. Now, if you're a master of the sentence, like, a, say, a Henry James, then, um, of course, you can write 200-word you know, sentences, and I'm sure they'll be perfectly crafted and there'll be no problems with them. But if you're like us mere mortals, I suggest that you probably should keep your sentences reasonably short to avoid uh, getting into all kinds of grammatical problems. Um, but that I should also add here that it's important to vary your sentence length as well. So you have maybe a shorter sentence followed by a slightly longer sentence and a shorter sentence and a longer sentence. That's quite nice to read that rather than a short sentence, short sentence, short sentence or lots of long sentences strung together. Um, okay, and a very, very quick nag. I couldn't really do a lecture on, ri on uh, writing essays without talking about commas and apostrophes. Uh, you must get commas and apostrophes right. And it is quite shocking sometimes to uh, the, the number of, of, of very intelligent students who've got quite good marks at A level who can't use commas and apostrophes. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite uh, surprising this um, and I think partly the reason is just because people learn how to use commas and apostrophes when they're very young and then um, they don't, they, they kind of slips out of their brain as they get older and they don't rejog their memory. You must get commas and apostrophes right so uh, maybe worth perhaps before you go to university spending you know an hour just you know googling commas and apostrophes and just refreshing yourself on how to use them.